again for coming to one of, another one of Hamish's lectures. Uh, we appreciate it, and uh, I'm sure as always you will enjoy it. Okay, um, folks, thank you very much for inviting me out today. And uh, we're going to be talking about Lincoln a little more. Did last time I was here too, but this time we're going to talk about a specific event with Lincoln, and that is the Gettysburg Address, one of his most famous actions, one of America's most famous speeches. And before I start talking about this, I always like to give a couple of pretty stock announcements. Um, you are free to get up at any time and move around, stretch yourself, visit the restroom if you like. Especially visiting the restroom, it's kind of tough to sit there for an hour while you're trying to, you know, be good. Um, so you can please feel free to do that. The other thing is if, if there's something that, as I'm speaking, uh, that you're not catching or you'd like a little clarification, you got a quick question, please feel free at any time to ask. I'd probably just put it off till the end if it's going to be a fairly long answer. And with Lincoln, sometimes it is. So, um, now folks, what we're going to be talking about here, and of course I, I've entitled my uh, speech, A New Birth of Freedom. That's of course a quote from the Gettysburg Address, which is one of usually considered one of Lincoln's two, one of two most famous speeches, the Gettysburg Address, the other one being his second inaugural. And there's really a, a kind of a running argument between historians about which one is the greater speech. Uh, and as far as it goes, many people think that that second inaugural, in that it inaugurated kind of an issue of the idea that peace should reign rather than retribution on the South, a lot of people will look at that and say this is a, a really good speech. The interesting thing about the Gettysburg Address is not so much the, the content of it even, even though it's a very moving speech, a very literary speech, it's that it signals a complete change in American political rhetoric. Uh, from the Gettysburg Address on, you will never hear an American politician go on for two or three hours. Uh, the American audience, quite frankly, really won't stand for it today. We would consider that to be a little odd. Somebody delivered an inaugural that went two, three, maybe three and a half hours. William Henry Harrison, his was, I believe, three hours and 45 minutes, uh, but they got retribution for that. He caught the, his death of a cold, and 39 days later became one of the first presidents to die in office. So it, it will happen. But what we see with the Gettysburg Address is for the first time, American political rhetoric becomes very, very succinct, very concise, very short. But that's also going to be intersecting with a few other things that are happening in American history at the time, and I'm going to be touching on those as well. But one of the things we want to understand, not only about the Civil War, but about war in general, is it tends to be a very transformative affair. When you have a war, generally the country that goes into the war is not the same as the country that comes out. And nowhere in American history is this more true than the Civil War. Before the Civil War, the country was largely agrarian. In fact, the vast majority of people were agrarian. When we come out of the Civil War, the trends are already in place for people to become industrial. And by 1876 or so, the, the population is becoming urban, and it is becoming kind of factory bound, you might say. It's very much the, uh, the blue collar kind of culture that we had. In another way, the, the transformation also happens. The, the total budget of the American government in 1860 was about $25 million. And by 1865, it's about uh, uh, $45 billion. So folks, the, the rise in the amount that you're putting out is just going to be incredible here. And so what we see is the transformation. It's really kind of a watchword. If you ever want to see transformation in the Civil War, folks, just a couple of concrete ways of looking at it. This is the best way. This is Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln somewhere around 1859-60 running for president. This is Abraham Lincoln in 1863. About three and a half years later, you can see the office is beginning to wear on. This is actually the last picture ever taken of Abraham Lincoln in 1865. Now, folks, if you want to see transformation, this is clearly, at least to my mind, a man who's already kind of on the cusp of really going downhill. There are many medical thinkers who, who believe that he would never have survived his second term simply because the Civil War had worn him out. He slept an average of about two to two and a half hours a night. He was somebody who was really put upon by the burdens of the war. And so you do see a, a lot of transformation like this. A lot of people, the country, and a lot of its individuals, are going to get a lot older during those four years. To me, the most telling transformation of the Civil War, though, is right here. I've always found this to be fascinating. And when you look at this, I actually, I no longer ask people to fill in this sentence because it's so simple that everyone believes I'm trying to trick them. So if I ask what the answer is, it'll go about 20 minutes with absolute dead silence in the room. And what you find is that, of course, the United States, right, if we, if we fill this in, very simple, the United States is big. Very simple sentence. What's interesting is that this answer is only correct since 1865. 
Before 1865, the United States was a plural subject. It becomes a singular during the war. The transformation of unifying that country is pretty amazing when you look at this, right? Or from another aspect. In uh, 1865, we know that a 13th Amendment was passed to the Constitution. This 13th Amendment ended slavery. Now, what you may not know is actually that that 13th Amendment is the second version of the 13th Amendment. The first one was actually passed by the Congress a couple of days after Lincoln took the oath of office. And this is what that first 13th Amendment looked like, folks. Article 1, slavery of the African race is hereby recognized as existed and shall not be interfered with by Congress, but shall be protected as property all, by all the departments of the territorial, uh, territorial government during its continuance. In other words, folks, this is a, a, a 13th Amendment that basically will say slavery is not only here, it's going to stay. It will not be interfered with by the government. Article 2, Congress shall have no power to abolish slavery in places under its exclusive jurisdiction. In other words, not only can they not ban it in Alabama, they can't ban it out west. And quite frankly, this implies they can't ban it in Connecticut either. Then it says, Article 4, Congress shall have no power to prohibit or hinder the transportation of slaves from one state to another or to a territory. If you have slaves, Congress was going to guarantee that you could take them anywhere in the country and they would remain your property. And then the part of it that Lincoln really objected to and the reason he did not sign the 13th Amendment is Article 6, which says, no future amendment of the Constitution shall affect the five preceding articles. In other words, Congress can never, in it, the future of its existence, pass any law that will take the place of this amendment. They were guaranteeing slavery as much as they could because they were afraid of a civil war breaking out. Now what's interesting is Lincoln did not object to this. He had said from the beginning he did not object to slavery in and of itself. What he objected to as a good, very highly paid lawyer and a constitutional lawyer was number six, which is that you cannot bind the hands of Congress in the future. <laughs> Nobody can do this and no one ever has done it. So if you really want to see transformation, folks, about four years later, here is your 13th Amendment, which says neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as a punishment for crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. In other words, from here on in, there is no slavery. And if you really want to see a revolution, folks, this is transformation. For the first time in the country's history, you have Section 2, which says, Congress shall have the power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation, which means, for the first time ever, Congress can go to Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, and say, you will have to end slavery. Up until this time, the Tenth Amendment to the Constitution, which stated that if a power is not expressed, given to the national government, it is the power of the states to dictate. This is really a revolution, folks. So we see a lot of transformation in that war. And a lot of this is going to come kind of as a focal point with that Gettysburg Address. Now, why is this? Well, there's a few reasons. Reasons for the Gettysburg Address on Lincoln's side are pretty clear. Now, this is what the country kind of looked like during the Civil War. And we can see, right, the green is, or the Confederate, the pink of the Union, and then the purple, areas claimed by the Confederacy, but never ruled by them. And what's interesting is, we see this in about 1865, by, or I'm sorry, by 1861. By 1865, the war is over. But if you think about it, folks, that means 1863. The war is right in the middle of being fought. And quite frankly, as, uh, as Mr. Shakespeare probably would have said, it was really the winter of their discontent. In the middle of the war, there were men being lost by the thousands, more than we had ever seen before in any war in history. And it didn't really seem that things were happening. Now, to Lincoln, this isn't true. If you look at this map, what it shows you is each year the progress made by Union armies. And so, in 1861, it's the white area, but then 1862, 63, and then you can see in 64, the Confederacy is being ground down. The problem is that in the middle of the war, no one really sees it this way. They see that their sons, their brothers, and their fathers are not coming home. They see that even though Washington tells them everything is great, as far as they're concerned, they really have no idea what's going on down south. They don't even have any exposure down south. 
People are very discontented. There will be more than this reason for it. However, this malaise about being in the middle of the war is going to be a big thing. But there's more than simply that reason for discontent. It was 1863 that Abraham Lincoln changed the fundamental nature of the Civil War. Now, folks, generally speaking, when we talk about why the Civil War happened, you will hear a few different answers. Generally, if you're talking to somebody who's really a, kind of a South Carolinian, a states rightist, somebody who's really kind of pro-Confederate, they would probably tell you that it was states' rights that was going to create that war. That is an oppressive national government. It's going to come down and try to dictate to people what to do. Now, if somebody else were, were talking about it, they might tell you it was basically uh, slavery that did this. And that is, when somebody in South Carolina says that they want their rights respected, there's really only one right that they wanted respected. That was the right to get their living out of the backs of others. And so, for many people, slavery was the cause, but nobody was going to admit that. And the reason was that people were afraid that this would unleash a race war in the United States that might actually end up killing not so much the, third, the 28 million white people in the country, but the 4.5 million blacks in the South under bondage. That they might actually end up getting massacred by this. There were other people who believed that the country was so racist that quite frankly, saying openly that we're fighting for the end of slavery would have been politically unpopular. And yet, Lincoln does this. He does it as a military measure, and in 1862, he passes what's called the Emancipation Proclamation. And when he does this, all of the people who are currently under Confederate control, under the proclamation, will now be free. And they can do pretty much whatever they want. And this was pretty scary to the people down south, but it was also scary to the people up north. The people in the north as well as south pretty much had the same attitude about African Americans. That is, they looked down on them, they thought that they were inferior genetically, morally, racially, uh, 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 physically as well. That actually what you find is that a lot of people were not ready to have people actually enjoying equal status. Connecticut's a good example. The war was over in 1865, folks. The first time a black man could vote in Connecticut was in 1871, six years after the end of the war. And I might add, after every other southern state already had accepted the 13th Amendment and allowed blacks to vote. So we were one of the latecomers, actually, in this. This was not a southern phenomenon. But what you do find is that when Lincoln gets into office, he will say immediately this that there is no purpose directly or indirectly to interfere with slavery in the states where it exists. Once he says this, he binds himself to this policy. And this is something that he can't get rid of overnight. Now we know we don't like politicians saying something and then kind of backwalking on it. We've never enjoyed that, even if changing one's mind might be a good thing. So Lincoln, for a couple of years, is going to use this as his philosophy. And as the war goes on, it's going to become very unpopular with many people on both sides. And that is, with Mr. Frederick Douglass, one of the foremost African-American activists of the war, what he says actually about Lincoln's policy in the beginning is, whoever lives through the next four years will see Mr. Lincoln and his administration attacked more bitterly for their pro-slavery truckling than for doing any anti-slavery work. In fact, what many people believed was that Lincoln wanted the Union to be reunited so badly that he would have been willing to see slavery continue indefinitely. And indeed, Union officers in the first six months of the war generally returned escaped slaves to their Confederate masters under flags of troops. And in fact, what happens is that in May of 1861, a man named Benjamin Butler, strange Democrat, that is, doesn't like Lincoln too much, pro-slavery, comes up with the actual, uh, how would I say, the, the strategy for actually freeing slaves. And that is, he gets a couple of escaped slaves into his lines. Confederate officer sends under a flag of truce. He says, I want my slaves back. And Butler says, you know, I'm not going to give them back to you. That's really angry about this. Butler, he was known as a Massachusetts pro-slavery Democrat. And so the guy says, well, why not? And Butler comes up with a beautiful phrase. Lincoln loves this. He says, I'm calling it contraband of war. We have confiscated the tools you need to fight the war, and now we will keep them. If you want to call them property, we'll call them property too. But it's different property for us. This was something that Lincoln liked a lot. It was kind of the backdoor approach to it. Lincoln was a very kind of, uh, how would I say, circuitous man when it came to making laws and doing things. He never quite knew what he was going to do. So he really likes this, actually. But 
even as this policy is beginning to get more popular, even as Lincoln is allowing it to go in and actually begin to free more slaves, and even as Lincoln is beginning to consider in the summer of 1862 an emancipation proclamation, gets a letter from this man. This is Horace Greeley. Greeley, I, 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 don't, I know that this wasn't his nickname, but I prefer him to call him the weather vane. Uh, Greeley was a newspaper publisher, and it was a New York Tribune that he published. Very influential, but also very much going with the wind. When the Union Army would win a battle, he would go down and say, let's just wipe out everyone in the South. Let's just carry it through to the bloody end. Then they would lose a battle, and he would say, my God, you're idiots for carrying on this stupid war. So through the war, he goes back and forth. And this is a really interesting thing. He writes to Lincoln, and he says, in August of 1862, on the face of this wide earth, Mr. President, there is not one disinterested, determined, intelligent champion of the Union cause who does not feel that all attempts to put down the rebellion and at the same time uphold its inciting cause, that's slavery, are preposterous and futile. Now, what Lincoln says to him is very interesting. He says, you know, as far as I'm concerned, saving the Union is what I do. And he says in a letter back to the Tribune, I would free no slaves at all if I could do it and save the Union. I would free all the slaves and do it that way if I could save the Union. And if I could save the Union by freeing some and letting others be, I would do that too. What he has never said before is that he was ever even considering an end of slavery. No one notices this. They just see it come out. It looks like a very bland, vanilla statement from a guy who really never has any views anyway. That's Abraham Lincoln. And so they figure, that's just going to go on this way. As he writes the letter, the Emancipation Proclamation is in his pocket. He's ready to put it out. He's just never mentioned slavery before, and this is Lincoln's method. He puts it out into a letter. People look at it and say, of course, it makes perfect sense, so that when he does issue the Emancipation Proclamation, we're all ready for it. He was a master of this. And so he issues the proclamation. Now, what will happen is that there's immediately blowback all over the place. This is the Norwich Aurora, and it said, this act of Lincoln's, that is the Emancipation Proclamation, is the culmination of his stupidity. It changes the whole character of the war by making one of its aspects the abolition of slavery. That's Norwich, Connecticut? That's correct. Um, what you find in, uh, in Connecticut is that the newspapers are about evenly split between Republican and uh, Democrat. If I, I actually have a couple of quotations. Uh, they're not here because, quite frankly, they're pretty offensive. But the New Haven Register was very anti-Lincoln. And the stuff that they would write, you know, like I, I wouldn't even want to put it out nowadays. Except if I get really angry at the New Haven Register. You might do it there. <laughs> but yet you do find that in a couple of places there's a lot of Confederate sympathy. And what you also find is that the, Lincoln is really not popular throughout the war until about 1864. And, and it's interesting because when you see this idea of the stupidity, you don't see that kind of language too much. But in the Civil War, this is very much the, the, the method that people use. Now, when it comes out there for huge amount of blowback. A lot of people are angry about it. A lot of people feel that they've been kind of conned, that they went into a war to preserve the Union. Now they've got a war that's going to free slaves. And so a lot of people are going to be very much anti-Lincoln. This is probably the most anti-Lincoln. This is the Copperhead, ladies and gentlemen. His name is Clement Vallandigham. <clears throat> Clement Vallandigham was a lawyer from Ohio. And he ran for governor and actually served as governor for one term. And he couldn't stand Lincoln. He couldn't stand the Republicans. And he couldn't stand the Union war effort. What he said was the Lincoln administration has made this country one of the worst despotisms on earth. War for the Union was abandoned. War for the Negro openly begun. Defeat, debt, taxation, sepulchers, these are your trophies. His language about the, the war was so inflammatory that they actually exiled him. They literally brought him to the uh, border of Kentucky and Tennessee and basically said, see ya, kick him out into the Confederacy. Confederacy doesn't know what to do with the guy because he's, a, he's from Ohio. So they end up just bringing him down to Savannah, or uh, I believe Savannah, and then he just kind of got him out to sea. He ends up going to Canada, running again for governor, nearly winning in 1864 by only a few thousand votes he lost. There's really a lot of kind of anti-Lincoln sentiment out here. Why, I always like to say this too, um, kind of interesting that uh, uh, Vallandigham has, he meets his end in a very interesting way. After the war, he was a lawyer, as, as I said before, he was in a courtroom actually doing a summation, and he pulled out a gun because his client, he said, 
was not guilty of killing the guy. He was guilty simply of having a gun that went off easily. And he was showing people, here's how it does it. He shot himself in the head, and that was the end of it. Yeah, he was also, there's another interesting story about him, which was when they exiled him, a lot of people in the United States are very interested in this. You know, what, what happens? What's the meaning of nation to an American? You know, to most Europeans, it's, it's, most Europeans would say, well, the meaning of nation is, I've been here for a thousand years, and this is my nation. So when this question becomes so important and so interesting to people, that actually a man named Edward Everett Hale, not the man I'm talking about today, you'll see it resembles closely. He wrote a book called The Man Without a Country. And actually, this was about Volandigum, about what happens to somebody who literally has no connections around the world, right? And so, what we see is that all over the place, we're getting a lot of resistance. A lot of people think, in fact, and it's kind of strange, because I will tell you folks that race theory was alive and well in the United States, North and South. And it's always interesting to me that you see this kind of split in attitudes about African Americans. On one side, inferiority. That is, they're inferior morally, physically, intellectually. But then on the other side, they always seem to be the people who are manipulating white people into doing whatever they want them to do. And so you keep looking at it and thinking, which is it? You know? um, it's interesting because in the South, all through the war, they used to say, you know, these, the, uh, the slaves are much happier on the plantation because they're kind of you know, a little subhuman and we're helping them come along. But my God, if we ever free them, they're going to take over the entire South. They're going to burn down every plantation. They're going to take over all the governments. It's amazing the ability and IQ that they attributed to these inferior people. And here, very common political cartoon. Lincoln is taking the tightrope over the uh, Niagara Falls, and on his shoulders is this African-American, right? Slavery. And you might notice if you look at the guy's face, he's enjoying himself, right? He's manipulating the white man into doing what he wants. It's kind of interesting to see this. Very widespread attitude in the United States. But what's interesting also is that during this time, there's another attitude beginning to develop, which is these African Americans are really contributing deeply to the Union war cause. Now, you may be aware that 180,000 African Americans will end up serving in the armed forces, as well as another 20 or 30 in the US Navy. Now, what's interesting about this is this was the main kind of objection having African Americans in the army is that once they get in and begin to do this work, African Americans will then deserve citizenship, the ultimate manifestation of which is fighting for one's nation. This was something people really got nervous about. So when escaped slaves would come into the Union lines, at first what they did was basically put them to work, doing the same thing they did for the Southerners. <coughs> Difference is they got paid for it. And that's really about it. And I will tell you folks, they weren't treated very well very often. Um, also, I will tell you that Nearly every Union officer over the rank of lieutenant had his one or two personal servants that he took with him through the war. Not very different jobs, but what we are finding as time goes on is that they're being given some of the worst jobs to do. On the battlefields, they'll often be the grave diggers. This is actually at Cold Harbor. And you figure this, folks, about 15,000 men fell in about 15 minutes in this battle. So what they did was buried them on the field, and that's what they're doing now is digging them up, sending them all home. Right, so you get jobs like this done. There are also the stevedores, the loaders, right? And they are soldiers. What you're looking at right now is a meeting of the 29th Connecticut Regiment. That is the U.S. Colored Volunteer Infantry. This unit is the first black regiment that we fielded in Connecticut. And what happens is, as time goes on, people begin to realize, not that these men are supermen, that they're incredible soldiers, that they're all special forces, Green Beret types. Actually, what they, find, what they find here is that the most profound experience of the African American soldier is that it's precisely identical to that of the white soldier. Just as many heroes, just as many cowards, just as many people shirking off from the sick list, just as many people who won't surrender under any circumstances. Very interesting to see. By the end of the war, many people are saying this performance enables African Americans to qualify for citizenship under any conditions. Now, these two attitudes are beginning to kind of come into conflict in 1863, including there. I just wanted to read you these two, and then I'll tell you who said this. First quote says, I have had the question put to me often, is not a Negro as good as a white man to stop a bullet? Yes, and a sandbag is better. But can a Negro do our skirmishing and picket duty? 
Can they improvise bridges, sorties, flank movements, etc., like the white man? I say no. Clearly a racist view. The idea that intellectually they're not able to do these complicated things. The other quote says, I have given the subject of arming the Negro my hearty support. This, along with the emancipation of the Negro, is the heaviest blow yet given the Confederacy. By arming the Negro, we have gained a powerful ally. They will make good soldiers. The first quote is from a man named William Tecumseh Sherman. He believed truly, and, and he was what you would truly call a racist, without any kind of connotation on it. He believed that the Anglo-Saxon races were the superior on Earth. His best friend in the army, Ulysses Grant, felt ex exactly the opposite. Even within the army, you are seeing this kind of split. Abraham Lincoln, therefore, has two things that he wants the country to be very certain of. Number one is that we have to carry this through to the end. And number two, that what we're doing here is making good on the promise and plot in the Declaration of Independence that all men are created equal and that they're all endowed with the right to life, liberty, and property, or the pursuit of happiness, as they call it later on. Now, what happens, however, is there's a second thing that will come in at this point, a second kind of factor that is going to create the Gettysburg Address. And this, of course, is the Battle of Gettysburg. On July 1st, 2nd, and 3rd, 1863, and across a massive area, 172,000 men are going to engage in the largest land battle ever fought in North America. 51,000 will end up as casualties. Now, in places like this, this is actually Little Round Top you're looking at from the Confederate side. They try to charge up here. In the front is this little stream which so many wounded men fell into and men died in that it was called Bloody Run during the battle. It actually ran red because there was just so much blood flowing into it from the field. But you also see in other places, right? Cemetery Hill here and Culp's Hill. Also here in Seminary Ridge where you're standing in the Confederate position. And then at that line of trees you see that Cemetery Ridge where the Union Army was. On the third day of the battle, one of the largest actions seen in North America, Pickett's Charge. 15,000 men go up one area in the Union line. In 50 minutes, 13,000 casualties were going to be incurred by weapons of fire about three times a minute, folks. Very bloody battle. Now, the interesting thing about the bloody battle is we often look at this from the perspective of the Army. And the Army fought the battle from the 1st to the 3rd. On the 4th, no one fought. The skies opened up, big storms, and the Confederates began to retreat south. What does the Union Army do? They get themselves together, and they begin to pursue. That is where most people stop thinking about Gettysburg. Gettysburg, however, did not. The Battle of Gettysburg is fought in July. Generally, about 90, 95 degrees, about 95 to 100% humidity. And what that means, folks, is that after the battle, thousands of men were laying out in Pennsylvania farmland under a broiling sun. Now, what you can find here is if you look closely, you'll see this. You notice this gentleman right here. There has never been a Civil War soldier who was that fat, folks. It just doesn't happen. They don't eat enough. What you're looking at is a body bloated in its gases by the heat and the humidity. And what's happening out here is that this place, quite frankly, stinks like a charnel house. They said it didn't smell right until about 1867, 1868. They're still pulling bodies out of that field. All over the place. And you notice him, right? Look at this bloated stomach. All of that, it just stinks. And then what they're finding out is two other things. Number one, there are 5,000 horses and mules also killed at the Battle of Gettysburg. They're all just laying out in the field. And I can tell you from my experience in the Park Service, folks, there's nothing you can do about a dead horse. I mean, basically all you can do is chop it up into pieces and, and let it go. I don't mean to be rude, but the simple fact is there's nothing you can do with them. You don't have a crane to move the things. You've got 1,000 pounds of dead weight, and it's rotten dead weight. What they also find is that now the children are beginning to find that it's fun to play out here. Because if you think about it, folks, children get used to anything very quickly. What they find is that, my God, we go run out here, we can find bayonets, we can find money, we can find guns, we can find uniforms, and what they also found out, are you guys all right with me so far? Yeah. All right, this is going to get bad. But they also found that when you go up and take a running leap and jump onto the stomach, that this, you can first of all burst these guys, which is kind of a wild sound, but that also clouds of flies will just fly out of the mouth, and they begin to play these games. As you can imagine, Gettysburg isn't happy about this. And so, this man, David Willis, begins to say to the governor of the state, now this is a, a leading lawyer, 
state representative in town, and he says, we've got serious hygienic problems here in Gettysburg. And what he says is, in many instances, arms and legs and sometimes heads protrude from the ground, that is. My attention has been directed to several places where the hogs were actually rooting out the bodies and devouring them. Now, as this is happening, and you can imagine it, when you're thinking about a battle in very real terms, this is what's going to be left afterwards. The Army's not really worried about this. They're chasing General Lee's Army in Northern Virginia, down into Maryland. And at this time, if you're in Gettysburg, you really wanted to be treated to something insulting. Every con man in the area is coming in and trying to buy up land around the Gettysburg Cemetery, figuring they're going to make a bundle when these guys, these guys all have to be reburied. Many of them will not be identified, and so, you know, this is going to be a good deal. And so, Willis is extremely disturbed by this. Gets in touch with this man, Andrew Curtin. Now, Curtin is governor of Pennsylvania, and Curtin is very strongly pro-Lincoln, very strongly pro-Union. And what Curtin comes up with is an idea, revolutionary idea, but one very much in line with social norms at the time. And that is, he says, let's make a national military cemetery. It'll give us some place to put these people. We can do it in a respectful manner, and we can avoid all this kind of the, the disgusting stuff that we're seeing going on in Gettysburg. And so, actually, folks, if you're curious about it, um, they were getting bids of anywhere from $1.50 to about 13 bucks a body to, to dispose of them. They finally got rid of them at $8.50 a body, and that's what it cost the U.S. government to bury all the men in that uh, cemetery. Now, here's the interesting thing. To us, the idea of a national military cemetery is old. This was the first one, but to us it's over 150 years old. However, the whole idea of a cemetery is actually a new idea in the 19th century. Up until then, we hadn't had cemeteries. We had graveyards. And if you ever want to see what a graveyard looks like, folks, go to an old Congregationalist church from the 1700s, and there's the church, and right next to it will be a yard with a bunch of graves in, in lines. That's a graveyard. Very simple, right? Now, what we're going to have now is in the 19th century, a new movement comes up, and that movement is called the Garden Cemetery Movement. Must sound a little strange to you, but when they decide to make the National Military Cemetery, this is the man they get to do it. His name is William Saunders. Saunders is a Scottish man who had come over and worked for the now, uh, at this point, very new U.S. Department of Agriculture. Now, Saunders was a protege or apprentice for this man. This is Frederick Law Olmsted. And folks, we, if you live in New Hartford, this man is probably more responsible for the way this town looks than any other single individual in American history. Olmsted was really the first landscape engineer. He's from Hartford, Connecticut. And what Olmsted came up with is a few ideas that are very, very influential today. First one is that he believed that people shouldn't be living in kind of a brownstone setting. That the, if you keep making these cities grow bigger, he believes, people will simply become alienated from one another and they will become very unsocietal, you might say. Instead, he said, what we should do is make large areas with very winding streets, lots of trees on them, houses that are close together, close enough to kind of give you a village feeling, but far enough apart that you don't have to listen to your neighbor arguing at night. This is really good. They call these suburbs. And so today, this is really his design. You want to go up and, and drive in any suburban development made in the 50s or 60s. That's basically his stuff that you're looking at. Now, the other thing that he creates is the park movement. Olmsted believed that parks were going to be able to provide for the working man what uh, places like the, the Adirondacks and the Catskills provided for the 1%. So in the summer, we would leave our, right, our, our paltry hovels in Hartford and New Haven behind and then we would go up to the Adirondacks and have our servants serve us, right, mint juleps while we're looking at Mount Marcy. It's a beautiful place. The thing about it is, working class people couldn't do that. And so, what Olmsted does is designs parks. And this is really where he gets his fame. This is Edward Park, which is on Whitney Avenue in New Haven. He also designs Beardsley Park in uh, Bridgeport. He designs, probably his most famous one is Central Park, which is in New York City. But if you ever want to see Olmsted's work, probably the easiest place to go is actually the Bushnell Park, which was also designed by him. And so if you're looking at it, you'll notice a kind of rolling area, a lot of different trees around, very bucolic looking, even though it's in the middle of the city. Same thing if you've ever been in Central Park. You see a very bucolic, winding little paths. This is really designed to give the working class person 
a little bit of time off from the industrial world. He believes that this will do some good. And, and actually, many people believe that he was instrumental in creating a lot of the kind of wilderness-looking area, especially in the northeastern United States. Now, at this time, as I said, garden cemeteries were becoming very popular. It's kind of interesting to see this. This is the Mount Auburn Cemetery in uh, Massachusetts. And these were different. A graveyard is a place where you have literally a stone that says John Smith here, Jane Smith here, right? And, and it goes right down the line. A cemetery is designed, believe it or not, to be a place where children are encouraged to go to realize how close death is to all of us all the time. In the 19th century, death was very much a constant companion, especially of the young. If you've ever read Charles Dickens, folks, Oliver Twist is basically the whole story is about little kids who are basically tubercular, they're going to be dying. You see this all the time. And this is really what it's designed to do. And so if you go across the street and you want to go into the cemetery, you'll notice it's kind of a place that kind of prompts meditation, contemplation, right? Now, as I said, this was the first one. And this is the design that Saunders will make for the National Military Cemetery. Now, when he does this, folks, his first concern, very big, is how to arrange the bodies. Who gets priority of place? Who's going to be closest to the center? Who will be farthest away? These are very big issues because any state that you slight will not like the fact that you did it. And so what Saunders comes up with is this half circle design. All of the states are given areas in that half circle to kind of be equidistant from the very center of the, uh, the monument here, which is, I'm uh, sorry, the monument which will mark the center of the National Military Cemetery. Now, folks, have you ever heard that Lincoln whipped off the Gettysburg Address on the back of an envelope coming up on the train, you know? Uh-huh. It's, it's a great story. And, and you know, have you, you guys, do you guys remember 35 years ago? Do you guys remember Michael Jackson writing a song called uh, We Are the World? You guys remember this? You know, and you kind of, everybody stands up. And they said to Michael Jackson, like, you know, when you, when you wrote it, Michael Jackson, you know, how'd you do it? He said, it wasn't me that wrote it. It was the hand of God. Like, oh, okay, you know, good enough, you know. But that's the Lincoln legend. This is a guy who just sat down and whipped off a couple of thoughts on an envelope, and that's great. Let me tell you something. You ask Abraham Lincoln how he is, he's going to write a five minute memo, go over it 14 times before he looks at you and says, fine, thanks. He is a very careful man. Anyone who tells you that he whipped that off in the back of an envelope is way off the mark. But also, Lincoln, he would laugh at such things. He would never have created such a thing. In fact, Lincoln knew about the design of the National Cemetery from the first days. He visited Saunders in his office, went over the design, what are you doing with it, how are we doing, and he messed constantly with his drafts of the Gettysburg Address. In fact, um, even after the speech, he messed with it. There are now six extant versions of the Gettysburg Address that were written by him. You know, Lincoln is weird this way. I, I can show you letters, actually, that he wrote would well, have one word that he spells two different ways in one letter. You know, the, the English language is not quite what it is today, right? But it's really interesting that he actually had contact with this from the very beginning. Now, here's what's also interesting. When they decide that they're going to dedicate this, the last guy they want at that dedication is Abraham Lincoln. In fact, what they're going to do is they're going to uh, uh, actually invite another guy. I'm going to show you his picture in a minute. Just wanted to kind of see, this is what the, the uh, artist rendition of it looked like, right? And again, you get this right, beautiful cemetery. This is the middle of it, and here's the memorial, right? And so, when they actually think about dedicating this, this is the Connecticut section, 22 bodies. I will tell you folks, there are a few people in there that we don't think are Connecticut people. Um, there are also a few Confederates in the National Cemetery, believe it or not, as well. Um, there's a lot of mixed up stuff but that goes on with this. Here's also a, a really neat one. On November 19th, 1863, one of the last soldiers buried in this little circle actually died on that day. As Lincoln gave the Gettysburg Address, he dies in a house in Gettysburg. He'd been mortally wounded in July. But it took him four months to die. And when he dies, he actually was the great-grandfather of Richard Nixon. So yeah, there's got all kinds of little trivia stuff in here. But, this is the man that they want to dedicate the National Cemetery. This is Edward Everett. Now, Lincoln, they don't want him. I'm going to explain this in a minute, but I've got to tell you folks, nobody wants Lincoln anywhere near an event that requires that you be 
uh, how would I say, respectful or serious or in any way kind of gentlemanly. This is the guy they want. And so they get Edward Everett to do the keynote address. Now, Edward Everett is an interesting man. Not the kind of guy you, you read about, because he's not a president, you know, he's not a general, but Secretary of State, President of Harvard, among his students was Ralph Waldo Emerson, another one of them was Henry David Thoreau. He is considered one of the greatest intellects and politicians in the early 19th century, which is kind of strange. You don't often get that combination. He was also considered the best public speaker in the country at the time. And he always did a couple of things. One of the things that he did was that when he did a speech, he researched it assiduously. And so he was out in Gettysburg for about a week before the battle, walking the entire battlefield. And he gets his speech together, and he always had this shtick. He would always come up to the podium, and the podium would be here, and he'd put his speech on it, and he'd stand up and he'd start thinking. And then after a couple of minutes, he would be transported by emotion. And he would do one of two things. Usually he would just put his hands away and say, I, I can't read my speech. I'm just going to have to tell it to you from the top of my head. Well, he had memorized the entire speech beforehand. So it was very dramatic. But the other thing he used to do, and it was always good, I always liked this, is he would just take it and just sweep it off the podium. The papers would go everywhere. My, my God, you know, it's the moment for him, right? And it, but he was great at it, you know? Now, for Lincoln, the last thing you want is something like this. Edward Everett's a great guy to speak at these things. He really knows his place. He knows what he wants to talk about. He knows what people wants to hear, what, what people want to hear. Lincoln is a man that tends to make really dirty jokes at really bad times. And so there's all kinds of stuff about Lincoln where there's a uh, story that is untrue, but the story goes around that after the Battle of Antietam, he and a friend of his, I'll show you his picture, his name is Ward Lehman, were actually driving around the battlefield and then singing happy songs while they were watching thousands of dead people. Now, it's, a, it's really fake news. There was a lot of that back then. But the idea that somebody would tell that story and expect it to be believed tells you what, how people kind of thought of Lincoln. Lincoln was an afterthought in this. And so they asked him, would you like to come? And they said, make a few appropriate remarks. And they were very literal with this. They didn't want him speaking for two hours. They wanted him to speak for a couple of minutes. This is a funeral oration that he's going to make. Surprising to everyone, he accepts the invitation. And when he does, they're kind of like, geez, we, we don't know what this guy's going to do. We don't know what he's going to end up you know, saying at the thing. But he's the president. Once he says yes, that's it. Now, what will happen is that on November 19th, right, 1863, they will go to Gettysburg. It's a kind of a cloudy, kind of nasty day out. It's in November, right? It's a little bit drizzly, very gray. And when they come up, it's a huge crowd standing there, massive, right? And so, into the area of what is now the National Military Cemetery, there are thousands of people crowding in. In behind it, I always like this part for Edward Everett. Edward Everett had a problem, a physical problem, and that is he was an older man, and he had a problem with his bladder, which is he couldn't go for too long without having to urinate. You know, pardon me. But what he does is wherever he speaks, he will set up there for a big tent right behind the podium so that at the moment when he needs to, he can just duck out very discreetly and then come back. And everybody in the, who was there, all of the, the dignitaries, thought that this was like a green room for all of the, the VIPs. So he's back there, like, and he's like standing there, like, you know, and all the people are standing up, whoa, what do you think? You know, have a drink, you know? And finally, they had to usher them all out so that he could relieve himself and then come out. But this is what he does, folks. And if you want to see the transformation, this is a very interesting thing. This is his opening sentence, 53 words. Standing beneath this serene sky, overlooking these broad fields, now reposing from the labors of the waning year, the mighty Alleghenies dimly towering before us, the graves of our brethren beneath our feet, it is with hesitation that I raise my poor voice to break the eloquent silence of God and nature. Beautiful. And folks, I'll tell you what, what no matter what you think, this guy delivered a two and a half hour speech that was nothing short of brilliant. If you, you can find it on the internet. You just go and say Edward Everett Gettysburg and you'll have the whole thing. It's about 40 pages long. It's a good two and a half, three hour speech, but it's really incredible. I can tell you, I was a park ranger at Gettysburg, and I gotta tell you, you read that speech, it looks like this guy was a soldier on the field. He knew where every unit was, he knew every action. It really was brilliant. But this is the transformation, folks. He speaks for about two and a half to three hours. He sits down. 
thunderous applause. People just, they thought it was fantastic. And then, as he sits down, this man, this is Ward Lehman, who was kind of the self-proclaimed bodyguard for Abraham Lincoln. There was no uh, Secret Service protection for the, the president at that time, which, I don't know about you, but the president, they, he had the habit of walking the streets of Washington, D.C. at 2 o'clock in the morning, and they never had protection for the guy. I, you know, of course, I guess if you see a six foot five guy walking through the street, you're probably going to go to the other side of the street anyway. But it's kind of interesting to see this. This is a guy who kind of took it upon himself to, um, to be with Lincoln most of the time. Lincoln will then stand up, right? And right here, the only picture we have of him at Gettysburg, and actually, folks, no one really even knows where this speech took place within the cemetery. Um, a lot of people have theories, but that's about it. But he will stand up and then he will deliver a speech. Now again, folks, you may have heard the legends that when he stood up, he delivered his speech and then sat back down and people were still clapping for Edward Everett. In fact, this is really not true. When he stood up to speak, it was very much a very short speech, but he was interrupted three times for applause. People actually did enjoy the speech very much. Now when he sat down, he said to Ward Lehman reportedly, we don't know if he said this or not, but he said, Looks to me like that went over like a wet blanket. It was Edward Everett, a couple of days later, who wrote him and said, you summed up the whole of this thing in two minutes better than I could do in two hours. And from there, you be, do begin to see kind of a, a, a change in the way we perceive this speech. This is his entire speech, folks. And it's interesting. 53 words in that opening sentence. 251 words in the entire speech. In this version. There are, as I said, six versions of it. They'll change for commas and a couple of words here and there. But what you also find is, this is really American political rhetoric from now on. I'm sure you're kind of aware of this opening stanza where he says, four score and seven years. And if you think about it, folks, all he really says is, you know, 87 years ago we had a Declaration of Independence, and there it was. Now, we said that everybody was equal, and now we're fighting in a war to, to see if that's true. It's really not much that he's saying, but this is also another transformation. Right here, in these last two paragraphs, what he will say is something we have never heard a president say before, and that is, right? He says, in a larger sense, we cannot de dedicate or consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The people who had died there had done that better than he could have. But he says here, it is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us. That is, the president is standing at the bully pulpit, he's exhorting the nation to go on and to bring this thing to a head, to bring it to an end. We've never heard this before. This has never happened before. Presidents were not made to exhort the nation to do anything. This is really something we consider kind of a 20th century innovation. People like Theodore Roosevelt, we think, had the bully pulpit, as he called it. But the fact is, what he's doing here is really a very, very interesting thing. This is the first case of really modern American political rhetoric, and it's the first time that the president is really the nation's number one cheerleader. What's interesting is, after this, Edward Everett type of speeches will not occur in American history again. This is about the last one. Yeah, please. Yeah, I'm just thinking, also Lincoln uses the first person plural. Right, yeah. And uh, Everett, at least in the excerpt, was the first person singular. Right, well he was, and that's really because he was speaking about his impressions of the battle. Whereas Lincoln by now is beginning to be this kind of, you know, like the demigod figure. He, you'll notice more and more references to spirituality here, for instance, right? And so, I, and I'll, I'll end in just a second, but go ahead, please. Isn't is it true that Lincoln somewhat modeled this speech on Pericles? Oh, yeah, on his funeral oration. Funeral oration. oration. Right. Yeah, and, and in fact, this <clears> was this thing <throat> about a few appropriate remarks, the way he took that, was that he didn't want to make a three-hour speech. He wanted to make a very short one. Because at Pericles' funeral oration, which was actually for victims of the Peloponnesian War, um, he was found the same thing, that other people made long speeches, but he was fairly succinct in what he said. And so, yeah, you do find the exact same thing at, in the Gettysburg Address. Now, folks, what happens here is very interesting. On November 19, 1863, he makes this speech. Now, at this time, there is a Confederate army around Chattanooga, Tennessee. And at this time, when he makes the speech, only about five days later, that Confederate army is ejected from Tennessee down into Georgia. And many of the people in the United States feel that some kind of door has been opened. It's now we're seeing the end of it. Once the Confederates were pushed out of Tennessee, 
Um, what's going to happen is really the, the inevitable end of the Confederacy. And this is going to be the responsibility of people like William Tecumseh Sherman, who marches through Georgia to ensure that the Confederates know that they cannot uh, resist against this behemoth Union army. But the fact of the matter is, a lot of other things are going to begin to happen at this point, too. After the Gettysburg Address, the idea of blacks fighting for the United States becomes more and more popular. The idea also of not giving an Emancipation Proclamation, which is a military thing, but a true 13th Amendment to the Constitution suddenly becomes a reality. And after Lincoln is elected or re-elected in 1864, this is going to be his first order of business. And in fact, it is passed in January of 1865. Now folks, if you've ever seen the movie Lincoln, uh, you might want to just make sure that you know, they, they went for the accuracy and all that. Connecticut did not, in fact, oppose the 13th Amendment, which it had in the movie. I still bear resentment about that. But um, actually, but what you do find here is that he was the one who ushered in a lot of things. A lot of things are going to kind of find a focal point here. The change in American attitudes toward the war, the change toward rhetoric, the change toward the role of the president. Please. The Confederate states didn't vote for it because they weren't part of the Union at that time. No, as a matter of fact, they were still in the Union. But uh, more often than not, it was a county or a, um, a state's uh, job to put people on the ballot. So in places in Alabama, there are counties where he didn't appear on the ballot. I'm so talking about the 13th Amendment. Oh, uh, and I'm sorry, could you repeat your question? I'm so, sorry about so that. The, the state, you have to have so many states right. through oh, the amendment. Oh, right, that's exactly right. My question right. is, to, were the southern states part of that majority? Well, uh, they didn't have to be. Um, actually, when they passed this, first of all, it's January of 1865. The end is coming very soon. What they said to the Confederate states, and this is really, this gets into Reconstruction, which is a, a long topic, but Lincoln's plan for Reconstruction was very simple. That is, if 10% of the folks that you could field in 1860 will take an oath of loyalty to the, to the U.S. and you accept the 13th Amendment, you can get, get back into the Union. The Congress was not going to have that. In Reconstruction, they, they went after that, uh, that idea. And what they wanted, and this is the, the interesting thing, they wanted to hurt the South. So what they said was, accept the 13th Amendment, yes, but you need 50% of the people who voted in 1860 to, to sign an oath that they will not and have never been disloyal to the United States. Go and find 50% of any southern state where you can find that, and you won't. They knew. The only people who hadn't been disloyal were freed slaves. So they knew exactly what they were doing. You know? Yet it's, it's caused actually lasting resentment between the sections. Very interesting this thing. But this is the 13th Amendment, folks. And as I said, if you want to see the ultimate transformation of the war, it's right here. Not only are we going to actually start dictating the social relations between people and economic relations, but now Congress is going to have the power to dictate these relations to the South. And this is really the beginning of Lincoln's kind of reputation that we have today as that kind of demigod. Here is also the beginning of the racial reconciliation that, quite frankly, I don't think we've seen the end of yet. I don't think we're very close to it yet. But it's interesting because here, this is a Harper's uh, Weekly uh, ad, it's, or uh, cartoon says, a man knows a man. Give me your hand, comrade. We have each lost a leg for the good cause, but thank God we never lost heart. Right? And you're beginning the very slow process now of integrating the African Americans into society. As I said, it's a slow process, but it's one that actually started pretty well. And this was a very common theme of cartoons back then. This is ant emancipation, and on the left side is before, and on the right side after. So on the left side, you'll notice stormy weather, the slave sale, selling off the families, and also here you might notice guys going to whip this woman. You know, again, you know, horribly barbaric. But then after emancipation, you see the children running off to the ultimate manifestation right here of freedom, and that is the school. They're going to learn how to read, write, and cipher. And that will really set them up for citizenship. And also here, when they're going to get paid, that is, Instead of being a slave, now you are going to be given the money for your efforts. Yeah. And so, really, folks, when you look at the Gettysburg Address, it's really kind of the linchpin, the hinge upon which re uh, Lincoln's reputation, American political rhetoric rests, and also kind of marks the, 
the beginning of the end of the Civil War and the, and the kind of the end of that malaise in the middle of it all. Well, folks, thank you very much. This is my, my uh, presentation for today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, as a matter of fact, he was acquitted. 
So yeah, and so yeah, the ultimate sacrifice for the lawyer, you know. You wanna you wanna start publishing that on your Facebook page, right? You know, hey, you know. Yeah. Actually, what's interesting is that there were a lot of those guys around. Um, we don't think so today. But if you think about, for instance, if you think about the Iraq War, when, the second one, when we went in, remember how much resistance there was to that? Now, in 100 years, I'll probably say, oh, there was an Iraq War. That's about it. There was a lot of resistance to that war here, too. Um, in newspapers all over the place, you can see ads. You know, if somebody runs away to Canada to avoid the draft coming, you know. but, but what were you going to Yeah, I'm just, I, yeah. as a uh, further brief follow on the Gettysburg Address, it occurs to me that, that the Gettysburg Address itself reads almost like an epitaph. Oh, yeah, I mean, very you much. Put it on a rather large gravestone, but right. you could put it. It's, it, it's fitting for its. Very uh, much. For, its, uh, for the place where he delivered. Right. It's a cemetery. And for its tone. It, it was a very respectful tone, which you really didn't expect out of Lincoln. He liked joking about stuff, and he was a very irreverent person. But actually what you find is that as the war goes on, his writings become more and more lofty. And I'm sure you're probably aware of the second inaugural, you know, with, with malice toward none, with Cherry. I mean, it's beautiful. It's incredible. And, and actually, uh, nobody really knows. You know, he was always a good writer. But... There are always questions about his spirituality that they don't think he was really a believer or a, or a Christian, although he said so in public, you know. But at, at any rate, yeah, it, it's really an interesting speech. I'm sorry. Yeah, the, other, yeah, the other thing about the address, uh, it puts a damper on straight, uh, states' rights and the address. Yeah, very much. The first thing he discusses is the Declaration of Independence. Right. It does not mention the Constitution. That's right. It's not the Constitution at all. So it changed the whole tenure of our government oh, yeah. in this country for up until today. Yeah, and, and i got to tell you, I, yeah. I, all I can tell you is not only do I agree, I, you know, I'd go further with that. He really did. Um, when you go back to the Constitution, that would have been preserve the Union. Right. It's not what he was saying. Is it, yeah. This is the ideal to live up to. And that appeared in a lot of Confederate newspapers. They said, look at the guy, he conned us all. You know? yeah. Oh, yeah, very much. So the first birth was the statement um, right. that created equal. Right. Well, you know what it is, is that we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. When you think about it, we tend to think of that in a civil rights fashion, because after the 60s, that's pretty much the way. But that was a statement of the Enlightenment. You know, in the, in the Enlightenment, it's the first time you began to say, you know, you, you may be a king, but geez, you know, I don't know why you're there and I'm here. You know, one of the things you find about the Enlightenment is they began to apply scientific principles to humans. And when you got a guy, like, let's say, uh, George IV of England, right? George IV of England was, I, I, he, you probably wouldn't have called him mentally deficient, but he was awful close. Do you understand? People say, well, what's this guy got? You know, in the, actually, do you mind if I say this? This is kind of interesting. In the Enlightenment folks, right? You've probably heard of Newton, right? Bacon's Law, Galileo, all of them. Right? You know what the most uh, popular form of literature is? And this is where you start seeing this. It's actually royal pornography. What the butler saw, stuff like that. It was, it began to come out everywhere because this is part of the questioning. You understand? This guy's just a guy like us, right? And King Charles II of England had 32 children out of wedlock. 32. He didn't even have a male heir. I, I don't know. How do, you, how do you do that? How do you do that? You know? But and the thing is, when they began to question that, what happens is when we created the country, this was very much the, the country of the Enlightenment. We are all here just by ourselves now. But what's also interesting, too, is that idea that when you had mentioned the, the Declaration before, I also want to say this, it's really fascinating that the Articles of Confederation, which was our first Constitution, was actually the Articles of Perpetual Confederation. And this was one of the things about the Constitution, is basically that's a, a test case. Is divorce legal in the United States? Can South Carolina divorce? Of course, today, we would never consider that. If you ever hear somebody talk in secession, you immediately think Rick Perry, you know, and, you know, yeah. you think about it, you know, but, yeah. Even, even today, even today, if you speak to states' rights people and you go back to say when Reagan was president, their feeling is that the, the, the states created the Constitution. That's right. Not That's created right. by the people, which right. comes from the Declaration of Independence of Thomas right. Jefferson, but that state, so, and today, you still have people thinking, well, this is what we're talking about, and what's great, sectionalism. Right. That's right. Well, and that's also, too, that has to do with the Tenth Amendment as well. The Tenth Amendment basically says, it's a, it's a kind of a catch-all, and basically it says if the feds aren't allowed to do this, then they're not allowed to do it ever. 
And that was something that did change. It changed more than once during the, the early history, but yeah, oh, very much. But please. Um, again, the issue of secession, there's nothing in the Constitution that I'm aware no. of that says that the state cannot secede, nor does it empower the federal government to use no. military force to keep that state in the Union. And the proof is in the pudding in the fact that Jeff Davis was incarcerated for quite a few years after the war ended at Fort Monroe in Hampton Roads, Virginia, even though he demanded that he be brought on a court-martial or a charge of treason right. before the Supreme Court, knowing full well he would probably win the case. But as a well, result, the yeah. federal government never tried it. Yeah. Is that correct? Uh, actually, I, he wouldn't have won the case. There's no way they would have allowed the presidency, the president of Confederacy. But he would have had an open venue to put forth his views, and that was something people weren't going to have. Um, the idea of secession since the Civil War has been really totally out of fashion. Although, like I said, I think the Civil War is almost, I, I don't mean to sound lighthearted, but almost as a test case as to whether or not divorce is legal. Because when you saw the first attempt at it, very weak attempt in 1830, Andrew Jackson basically put an end to it with a toast. And that was the end. But in 1860, when it happens, if you remember, James Buchanan, who was the president when the secession began, said, and, and quite, quite correctly, he was a lawyer, he said, secession is illegal but we can't do anything about it. And there you go. And, and that, that was basically it. Until Lincoln gets in and says, I will execute the laws in all the states where I'm the master. Yeah, and we still actually today, come to think of it, when we say the United States is, we usually refer, we're committing a grammatical error. Oh, yeah. And not that it bothers anybody. It certainly doesn't bother me. No. Yeah. But <laughs> that can almost be symbolic of yeah, to me, to me, that is the biggest single <coughs> manifestation of, of the war and what it did. You took a plural subject and made it singular. And you're right, even though we kept the plural form of United States, so it wasn't United States at that point. But, you know, what you going to say? Yeah. In, in previous lecture uh, on World War One, you uh, theorized that the uh, devastation that the, the French suffered from uh, affected them moving forward. <coughs> Absolutely. How would you relate that theory to what occurred uh, in the U.S. with the devastation? Yeah, it's a, it's a, you know it's an interesting question. Completely the opposite, and, and in fact, it, it's almost like comparing dogs and flutes. And, and here's the reason. Immigration. Uh, yeah, immigration is one of them. Lots of immigration. It goes down from 1861 to 65, but as soon as 1865 is gone, it comes back, roars back. But also here. Um, you had a lot, an entire generation of young men was traumatized by this. <coughs> However, unlike France in 1918, we had the West. So basically what I could say was, look, you came home six months ago. You've screamed every night in nightmares since then. Every night you're drunk because you can't handle reality. You're taking opium a lot, which is very common uh, in pill form or in uh, liquid form called Addison at the time. Why don't you just go out West and shoot people out there? You know, I mean, basically, and if you think of it, folks, you ever seen a Western movie? How many Western movies have you seen without some guy walking down with a two-gun package, right, kind of walking down and just whipping out his guns? Where do you get a skill set like that? You, I mean, you know, if you think about it, folks, if you know anything about guns, bullets cost something like 50, 75 cents each. You don't just go in and, and just like, oh, I'm going to just shoot off a thousand rounds today. That's a lot of money. So instead, these guys all trained in the Civil War and then went out west. And what you had out there was the one enemy of all, and that was the Native Americans. You know, our neighbor. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> and also, when you think about it, so many of our Western movies say are, are a continuation of the Civil War by other means. Oh yeah. They're, they feature Union right. versus yeah. other veterans, or usually that. But one, yeah. One thing they don't show you is in a Western town because I always, you know, the opening scene. It's always the same. You get that music. You know, the little, like, clopping, like the Monty Python and the Holy Grail thing, right? And then people are walking around, and everyone's walking around kind of in dude outfits and stuff. Uh-uh. It all would have been old, patched up, ratty Civil War uniforms. A third of the people would have had some kind of limb gone. I do want to tell you this. In 1866, this is a true statistic. It's amazing to me. In 1866, the 20% of the entire state budget of Mississippi was prosthetic limbs. So there are people all over the place who have been malformed and, you know. And what happens is, though, we have an advantage that France didn't have, which is you just send people out to the frontier. Many of them will die, but what they will do is open it up for people then who will come along later on. 
And so when you find the Wild West, right? If you were a Confederate soldier, you got captured first day that you were in prison camp. And by the way, you know, dysentery, smallpox, malaria, yellow fever, typhus, they're going to kill you. You know it when you get into the camp. They have no food for you. So you get in, and a recruiter comes out and says, look, guys, if you put your hand on a Bible, you swear loyalty to the US Constitution, we'll send you out west with a gun, you go fight in Indians. Literally, you had Confederate and Union soldiers standing side by side, fighting the common enemy. It was an easy way as a kind of an escape valve for a lot of that. It's interesting too, I, I will often, I don't really sound like I'm joking about it, but if you, let's say, get into a, a fight, you know, and we're not being personal here, right? Let's say you get into a fight with your neighbor, right? So, you know, and if there are any of them around, you know, we don't mean to say it. But you end up getting into a gunfight with them, which might have happened. All you had to do is basically get on your horse, you know, ride off a couple of towns, change your name. You were okay. They wouldn't know anymore. The West is an amazing thing for us <coughs> as an escape valve. From the very first days that we were out there. If you talk about guys like these, the mountain men that I'll be talking about, or a lot of these guys who fought in the war, the only place that they could go would be out in the wilderness. You wouldn't want these people around your dinner table. You know? I mean, if you were lucky, all they would do is just get drunk and smash up the kitchen. You know? But, so. yeah, when I was in Charleston, I went on a, uh, a tour, and a lady who was leading the tour called the Civil War the War of Northern Aggression. Yes, they do, and don't so, they? <laughs> so when you think about like what happened in Charlottesville, it was better. Right. Better it really all comes down that it was treason. Yeah. And and now we know we have high-minded individuals like you know, General Lee and so forth. Right. And, but the crux of the whole thing, this was what makes it so unusual, you yeah. know, about the thinking you know, of the sectional yeah. in the country. Well, you know, between you, between you and me, <laughs> how, do you, how do you justify your existence if you've lashed your living out of the backs of others? Yeah, how do you, you, you makes, can't. It made no yeah. sense, really. Yeah, Jefferson Davis was not going to be able to tell you that this was a good thing right. to get slaves. He's got to say this yeah. was the great lost cause, and he had to. And you it, know, it yeah. became romanticized. Right. It and became yeah. romanticized <laughs> in, in the study of history at a Dunning School in the early 1900s. Oh yeah. And right up through the, the early right up to the 20th today. century. Look, you, you know. go out, you go out into the Connecticut yeah. rural areas, and you see people with Confederate flags. Yes. All I can it think is Jesus. Very yeah, interesting. In the history yeah. books like Bruce Catton and so forth, and finally, like when McPherson wrote his book, yes. he said, yeah. well, the war was about slavery. Yeah. It was about slavery. Yeah. It, it is. Yeah. It's, it, it's, it, it's it, interesting it, to see the interpretation. Well, yeah. and you know, this makes me think yeah. how incredibly vulnerable a society is that rests on human slavery. Always has been. Yeah. Not I only the war yeah, yeah. and the revolution, the first thing. Yeah. Well, I'm free to slaves, which infuriated Jefferson, all our yeah. noble patriots. So I mean, the first thing, they're so vulnerable because the attacking power, if the attacking power can appeal to the enslaved underclass, oh, yeah. the, that's a permanent right. fifth column in your country. And, and what you've seen is that actually, if you've ever heard, uh, I'm sure you have, I, I don't mean it that way, but if you've ever heard of Athens and Sparta, Sparta was a, it was a slave state. 80% of their people were slaves. And how did they die? Thebes sends messages in, rise up, and we're outside the walls, we'll just burn it to the ground, and they did. But the other example of that, which I find very telling, is Rome. Rome was based on slavery, and in fact, if we were sitting here and you wanted to take notes, your slave would have been taking notes. You wouldn't be doing that. You, everything was done by slaves. What's interesting is, the finest engineers in Western history, you've got aqueducts still supplying water to towns. They never came up with a single invention. There's not a single invention you can attribute to the Romans, except, I believe, a variation on the water wheel. When you think about Greeks, right, who is just, at the same time, doing this, all of this philosophy, the Greek miracle of science, it's really fascinating to see that slave-based societies tend to have no innovation, and they tend to be very, very vulnerable. I guess you'd call it kind of political blackmail, you might say. Because you're right, you can just ask people to rise up. Yeah, very much. Well, folks, thank you very much.